1980s, I'm an 80s chick, I love 80s music, there was a song by a band called NXS, and the title of it always intrigued me. The song was called Devil Inside, and the chorus repeated, Devil Inside, Devil Inside, every single one of us, Devil Inside. I always used to think, wonder what the band meant by these words, Devil Inside, every single one of us, a devil inside. We are in the fourth of our series on looking at Satan in scripture and in our society. And we've looked at Satan as tempter and messenger, and we've looked at Satan as prosecutor last week. And now we're going to look at that. Look at how does Satan, how do we deal with the devil inside of us? Many years ago, I served as a pastor at a congregation in media, and one of my confirmation students was fascinated by the figure of Satan in the Bible. He would come up to me after services and he'd ask me all kinds of interesting questions about the devil. For example, he asked me, Pastor, just when was it that Satan fell and, and became a fallen angel? And I had to stop and think for a moment before I realized that, you know, there's no actual story about Satan falling from grace. And then we got talking about other stories about Satan that have developed like he became too prideful and was kicked out of heaven. And he got some other angels to follow him and he became the ruler of hell. And again, none of this is actually in the Bible. You know where it comes from? It comes from literature, such as Dante's Inferno or Milton's Paradise Lost. But these stories, we think that they're biblical and they, they come into our consciousness. And I tried to explain to my students that it's all part of the mythology about Satan, but we can't necessarily take all of these stories literally. Even the passages in the Bible that contain references to Satan are not necessarily to be taken literally. You know, there's not just some red god with black horns and a pitchfork running around. It's one of the things that we've tried to understand in this sermon series on Satan, we look at these different roles, and as I explained to my confirmation student, the meaning of Satan and the images and the stories go deeper than just the surface. And when I told him this, it's like a light bulb came on for him, and he said, oh, you mean Satan is like a metaphor? I said, ding, 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 that's it. You got it. The myths about Satan while not necessarily factual, they're not historical, they still help us to understand deep truths about humanity and about the world and about our relationship with God. Because the figure of Satan is what they call an archetype. It's a symbolic figure that you find in any culture, any religion. They all have some figure of this demonic force. And in many ways, Satan symbolizes the darker, uglier side of human nature. And we project the, onto this shadowy figure the things that we don't like about ourselves. And sometimes we even project this Satan figure onto other people or onto other groups of people. It's very easy to find the sin in another person and to call another person evil. And yet no one wants to be able to admit the devil inside of themselves. In fact, our entire media and political system is built around seeing the Satan in others, demonizing others, in order to make ourselves look good or feel good or superior. <coughs> We see news coverage of robberies and arsons and murder, and while we deplore the evil that is done, we get a little thrill in being able to say, well, at least I'm not as bad as that. And we see images of people with darker skin colors engaging in violent behavior and think, well, I don't know what's wrong with those black people. At least I'm not like that. 
where we watched news reports of terrorists committing horrendous atrocities in the name of Islam, and we think, what's wrong with those Muslims? You don't see Christians acting like that. But as a matter of fact, Christians sometimes do behave badly, and our history has shown that. And sometimes people with lighter skin behave badly. In other words, what we often ignore or overlook is that each one of us has the capacity to do evil or to commit immoral acts. We don't like to admit it. We like to think of ourselves as hardworking, honest, good Christian people. But if we deny what that song says that every single one of us, the devil inside, what happens is that we will be in danger of being lulled into the very evil that we deplore. The great psychologist Carl Jung once said that to deny one's shadow is to lose solidity or solidness, to become something of a phantom. Self-deception about our shadow self may increase our confidence, but it threatens our wholeness. That is to say, if we are not honest about our own capacity for doing harm to others, if we are not willing to admit that there is an underside to the face we show the world, then we are actually in danger of becoming complicit with the satanic powers, even if we're not aware of it on the surface. As we heard today in our reading from Jude, but these people slander what they do not understand, and they, destroy, and they are destroyed by those things. Woe to them, says Jude, for they go the way of Cain, murderers, and abandon themselves to Balaam's error for the sake of gain, and perish in Korah's rebellion. What he's saying is that when we talk badly about other people, the people that we don't know, the people who are different than us, the people that we don't understand, we end up being destroyed by our instincts of fear of the unknown. And this can lead to murder and stealing and mob violence. Now sometimes this is a difficult concept to understand unless you see it dramatized. This happened with my son Benjamin last year when we watched the movie The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Anybody ever see that movie or read the book, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas? It's a fictionalized tale of a German boy whose father was a Nazi, an officer in charge of a concentration camp. And the boy is instructed by his tutor and his father about the evils of the Jews. He is told all of the terrible, demonic qualities they possess. But he has secretly become friends with one of the Jewish boys in the concentration camp. And he has come to discover that this boy, this Jewish boy, is nothing like the satanic people that he's hearing his father and his tutor describe. And the movie has a very tragic ending. And it was difficult for my seven-year-old son, he was seven-year-old at the time, to wrap his mind around it because on the one hand, the Jews were not bad, and yet they were killed because the good Christian German people really thought they were bad. How can this be? The father loved his son. He was a good provider for his family and yet he was murdering innocent people and believing in his heart of hearts that he was destroying the satanic enemy, ridding the world of evil, when in fact he was the one perpetrating evil. I'll give you another example. In the book by Toni Morrison called Beloved, a former slave woman named Sepha struggles to hold on to her humanity when everyone else around her sees her as 
an animal, or possessing of a demon, or in some way in you. And in fact, whites themselves looked on blacks as the shadow of themselves, containing within their very skin the threats of dark evil. As one of the black characters observed, white people believe that under every dark skin is a jungle, swift, unnavigable waters, swinging, screaming baboons, sleeping snakes, red gums, ready for their sweet white blood. In a way, they were right, but it wasn't the jungle that blacks brought with them to this place. It was the jungle that white folks planted in them. And it grew, and it spread, until it invaded the whites who had made it. Made them bloody and worse than they wanted to be. So scared of they, so scared were they of the jungle that they had made. The screaming baboon lived in their own white skin, and the red gums were their own. In other words, whites see within blacks that primal, chaotic, jungle-like nature that threatens to overcome civilized white society with its untamed satanic power. But what whites don't realize is that the jungle we fear within blacks is the one that was planted in them by the white enslavement of their ancestors. This is the heart of darkness to borrow Conrad's term, to impose ruthless domination on a people resulting not just in their enslavement, but in the ongoing internalized oppression that blacks experience today. In a way, when we see things going on in Ferguson and New York, the jungle that we fear is the jungle that was put there a long time ago and is within us even today. And you can substitute any group you want for this thinking that the other is satanic. Heterosexuals thinking that homosexuals are perverted minions of Satan. Jews thinking Palestinians are soldiers of evil. Men thinking women are the handmaidens of Satan. Anytime one person demonizes another or one group demonizes another, you can be sure that there is at least some aspect of evil within themselves that they're either trying to ignore or to deflect onto the other. And we hear in this responsive reading we did from Ecclesiasticus, when an ungodly person curses an adversary, he's really cursing himself. Now, this is not to say that evil does not exist and that people don't do evil things. They do. In fact, next week we're going to talk more about how to identify evil and what we as a church can do to resist the forces of evil that do seek to destroy life. But you see, before we take that step, we have to be honest about our own capacity to do harm, to recognize the devil inside. You know, that's why we do the confession of forgiveness at the beginning of the service. Some people don't like all that talk about how sinful we are. Why are we starting our worship service in this really downer way? I want to start with an upbeat way. I don't want to be thinking about my sin. But here's the thing. Coming to church isn't just about feeling good. It's about being honest about who you are in front of God and in front of people that you trust. And then to recognize that we have choices that determine what role Satan will play in our particular situation. Every day, you are faced with choices as to how you will handle conflicts, how you will deal with people who make you angry, people who you are afraid of, how you will respond when people try to hurt you or act in a demonic way towards you. 
And let me tell you, there is nothing that Satan wants more than to suck you into that demonic cycle of retaliation and revenge. Because then it ends up destroying everyone involved. That's why Jesus says, I rebuke you, Satan. I am not going to play this game. I'm stepping out of this cycle, and I am taking a different role. That's why Jesus identified and cast out demons all over the place. Remember, when he encountered that man with the unclean spirit, and the unclean spirit said, what did you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, Holy One of God. Jesus says, be silent. Come out of him. And the unclean spirit was banished from that person. The demonic forces will try to make you doubt that Jesus has any power over evil in this world. But let there be no doubt. Jesus has everything to do with us. If you think you're just coming to church for a feel-good fix and share some coffee and cookies with your friends, you may be in for a big surprise. Just as the crowd gathered the synagogue thought they were in for just seeing their friends and having their cake and their coffee. And all of a sudden, Jesus is there casting out demons. My brothers and sisters, that is one of the things that we do in church. It's why we come to worship. And in our preaching and our teaching, we are putting the devil on notice that their hold on our soul and on our enemies and our society is coming to an end. The demon asks, have you come to destroy us? And we can say yes. Jesus stopped that demon in his tracks and said, silence, come out of him. Anti-Semitism, racial hatred, be silent. Self-centeredness, come out. Addiction to alcohol and gambling and drugs, be gone. War and violence, release them. Demons and bullying, come out. Corporate greed, you are banished. Let there be no doubt that the teaching and the preaching that we do in the name of Jesus has the power to cast out demons, no matter which ones you are facing. And if you feel like you are dealing with demonic forces, you can talk with me about it. I've had conversations with Christians who know that they're dealing with something more powerful than themselves. And so we need to pray and do the laying on of hands about themselves or about maybe their loved one. To for Jesus to release us from the demons who are hurting us and threatening us and scaring us. Because thanks be to God, Jesus is fighting for us fighting the demon, the devil inside of us, and is ultimately victorious. On that Good Friday, the demon thought that he had won. But the light of Easter dawn comes, and it shines, and Christ is our light. The, the demon shrieks and rise in pain as we pray our prayers and as we baptize another child of God and as we taste the bread 